know, we're here at the Atlan Airport, which is actually called Peterson Field, and it's uh, C Y S Q. If you want to know the uh, ICAO yeah. name, we're with Tundra Helicopters. Uh, my wife and I live here in Atlan, off and on for 35 years, and. Um, we actually started with in the fixed wing flying business and uh, had a company for 20 years. And uh, just in the last eight years, we've taken up flying helicopters and doing tours out of the Atlan area. So we have two different tours that we do. Uh, one is I call a Lake No Lake tour, which is a uh, it's a tour to uh, an area that's actually called a Yukalup. It's a Norwegian term and it's a valley that fills with water and ice and it becomes uh, full of ice and water and then it'll empty so one day it's a lake and the next day it'll be no lake. The lake's actually like about five kilometers long and sort of let's see 300 meters deep when it's full. So we go there and then also down to the toe of the Llewellyn Glacier which is a uh, glacier that feeds the Atlan Lake system and the Yukon River system. So those are two different tours that we do and we can take six people at a time and it um, ranges anywhere from two to three hours to an hour, it just depends how long people want to spend out at the glacier. So it's a pretty spectacular spot. And this one is a uh, spare sat phone, so just the second sat phone. Yeah. That's, and then in the, um, in the hat rack behind the seat, up in here is a first aid kit. In the back there, the uh, seat belts are sort of normal airline type seat belts to put them on. The only difference will be is that the shoulder harness, you have to put the flat buckle through the harness and then do it up. In the front, all the doors, all take care of the doors for the most part, but all of the doors operate the same, the handle pulls out to open it and then just leave it in the middle to close and then a little push and it should close easily. If it doesn't close easy, it's not closed right. And then on the inside, handles all the way back to open, in the middle to close, and then all the way forward mm -hmm. to latch. Okay. So our ELT is in the front left corner there. That's the emergency locator transmitter. And there's a switch for it on this side of the panel. The red one? The red switch, yeah. Okay. And then on this side is another red switch, but it's guarded, it's a fuel shutoff valve. So I say the only time you can turn that switch off is if the machine's laying on its side, making lots of noise, and the pilot doesn't seem to be doing anything. Mm -hmm. Then you can turn that switch off. Okay. Fire extinguisher is up in the middle here. No smoking in the washroom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is actually a pretty good window for taking yeah, okay. pictures yeah. from. Yeah. Um, and then somebody can sit up front. Okay. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I thought what we'd do is we'll go to the back side of Teresa Island first yes. and then see what the glaciers look like there. There's a good spot to land up there to get some, you know, good pictures of the lake and stuff. I don't know how windy it'll be up there. If it's really windy, we wouldn't, wouldn't stay long.
over Atlan Lake, which is the largest natural lake in British Columbia. And then we'll go down Tories Channel, which will take us down beside Teresa Island, which is the highest freshwater island on the planet. Um, as we get closer to the ice fields, we're going to see the water slowly change color from a deep blue that the lake is and, and to turquoise blues to a really muddy water. As the glacier is feeding the lake, it's generating silt and it pumps a lot of silt into the lake. So then we go to the toe of the Llewellyn Glacier and we'll see an area where it was full uh, it would actually was two lakes it was separated by the glacier and about eight years ago the glacier moved back enough to drain the upper lake and so it actually changed the river system and uh, the old riverbed is dry now and the water is about a hundred feet below the old riverbed If you come in Atlin, you can go with this man here. Jamie Tate. Jamie Tate. <laughs> <laughs> and with microphone. this guy here. Where are we? We're at the, the toe of the Llewellyn Glacier, which is um, the ice field itself actually starts down around Prince Rupert and goes all the way up the coast to almost Anchorage, Alaska. Third largest ice field on the planet. Non-polar ice field.
So and then uh, we went up and tried to get into Lake No Lake. <laughs> and uh, it was very cloudy and foggy and we saw it, but that was about it. <laughs> and then come back very high and see the whole Juneau ice field, which the Juneau ice field encompasses uh, an area from pretty much Prince Rupert, British Columbia, all the way up to Anchorage, Alaska, and is like the third largest non-polar ice cap on, on the planet. So a very large piece of ice. I mean, what's your dream? <laughs> <laughs> what's my dream? My goodness, you must... It's a very hard one to answer. I think I'm living the dream. <laughs> I live, uh, you know, we, my wife and I live in Atlan, which is a pretty special spot. And we go to Maui in the wintertime uh, for three months. And uh, I'm flying a helicopter. I can't think of too much better, other than I would like to build a big boat for Atlan and have uh, 100 people on the boat and we'll have gambling and dance hall girls and uh, smoking out on the back deck. That'd be my dream to bring more people to Atlan. We're in harder time keeping young families in Atlan because there's no work. And so we see the town slowly, the demographic getting older and older. and. Um, my feeling is that we need something to support the community and tourism might be our only hope. Um, uh, I expect, you know, within two or three years the gold mining will be finished because they will no longer be able to get a water license. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that be, there won't be any more gold, it's because they're, they won't be able to get water licenses anymore. I worry about young families not being able to earn a living here and uh, so they go to Whitehorse. 
So we lose all the young people to Whitehorse and it makes it harder and harder for young people to come and stay when there's no young people in town. Yeah. You know, I think it's a, it's a very normal or seems to be happening all across Canada. Small communities, the younger people are moving to the bigger centres and we're, we're losing those young families. When my children went to school here, there was over 100 kids in the school. And today, from kindergarten to grade 12, we were only kindergarten to grade 9 back when they grew up here. Um, from kindergarten to grade 12 now, there's 24 children. Wow. So we can barely keep our school open. And I know that um, one of the things my wife is working towards is um, a good friend of ours is Rick Hansen. And she's working towards being the first fully accessible community on the planet. So that gives us something to work towards, which would bring in, you know, sort of that level of tourists as well to make it accessible, inclusive, they're saying now. Yeah. now you know, so um, I see, you know, in order to live here, you need to pretty much be able to generate your own income because there's only a couple of government jobs and that's, it doesn't keep people here. The, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they come and go every two or three years, so those families come and go. And um, there's a government agent's office. And, um, you know, really, people have to be able to generate their own income. And, you know, we need carpenters, we need plumbers, you know, we need people that are journeymen with their hands. And it's hard to keep them here because there isn't quite enough yeah. to sustain a family, you know. so. We have to do something in order to survive is what I think, so. Mm -hmm.